him, God of drama, music, dancing. turn you over to Reverend, My um, Reverend Michael Record, who I know has something special for us this morning. Thank you, Thank you Anne. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Brothers and sisters, let us praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. Oops, sorry, wrong church. <laughs> Let us begin again. Good morning, friends. <laughs> Greetings to you, hundred or so, listening to me here at the Temple of Lights, Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica, as well as the thousands more listening online. It could be thousands. It's a beautiful day the Lord has made. Let us be grateful and rejoice in it. Please join me in expressing gratitude. Let us say together, it's a beautiful day. It's a and if you look around, you see that it certainly is. Guess what just happened to you? Some endorphin, which is a feel-good healing hormone, just got pumped into your body. How come? Because your words have a powerful effect on your body. Positive words have a positive effect. Negative words have a negative effect. In fact, at the back of your program, you'll see that Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our religion, religious science, is quoted as saying that every thought is creative. All thought is creative, every thought is creative. That can be interpreted on two levels. You think and something happens in your body. Because thought is an electrochemical movement in your brain. Something happens when you think. And sometimes you think and your outside world is affected. 
For example, somebody is healed by your spiritual mind treatment, AKA affirmative prayer, also known as affirmative prayer. Or you could get a parking space in a crowded parking lot. One big, one small, the universe doesn't know the difference. So for the rest of your life, think and speak lots of positive thoughts and words, and as few as possible of the negative ones. That's your first assignment. It's very simple, but if you do it, you'll have a happier, healthier life, guaranteed. You'll get another equally useful assignment later. This morning's topic is this thing called love. You know that Jesus spoke a lot about love, and one of his most important statements on the subject is found in Matthew chapter 22. When a Pharisee, who was described as an expert in the law, tested Jesus with the question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, and I'm quoting, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two commandments." Unquote. Now I want to step back from my topic, what is love, for a bit, and talk about the creation of this talk. Public speaking is one of the subjects that I teach. And I tell my students about the well-known KISS, K-I-S-S -S, technique of writing a talk. Keep it short and simple. And I tell them about the presentation technique. Stand up, speak up, and shut up. Which is equally well known, but not always followed here at the temple. I think you'll agree. And I tell my students that they should try to spice up the body of their talks with jokes and anecdotes. Now, Norman, we can always rely on for some excellent jokes, even when he doesn't have, say, even when he says he doesn't have any. I love those questions this morning. So when I began to write this talk, the first thing that I put down was the Matthew story of Jesus' reply to the lawyer's question. What I needed was some personal life experience to give body to the talk. And I had none at the time, nine o'clock on Monday morning. That's when I started. So with just the first paragraph written down, that Matthew story, I had to leave home to go to a faculty meeting at the Church Street campus of Excelsior Community College, where I teach, it's one of the places. Now, Romans 8, 28 tells us, and there is strong scientific evidence for it, that all things work together for good to them that love God. So it was no surprise to me that when I got to the campus, I had an encounter which gave me the material that I needed for the, the body of the talk. I met a woman I'll call Melaine. <coughs> it's not her real name. I first heard about her before I actually met her from my head of school, Kenny, in this faculty meeting which we were attending. She had left her home in Papine a few hours earlier in what Kenny said was a very depressed frame of mind. By the time she was seen by a security guard walking past the Church Street campus, she was feeling so hopeless 
that she was suicidal. Kenny told me that Melaine wanted to find work or at least somebody to talk to that morning when she left home. If she could find neither, he told me, she intended to jump off a Kingston Harbor pier into the sea when nobody was looking. For those online, and maybe some people here who don't know Kingston, the Church Street campus is just minutes from the foot of, on foot from the harbor, while Papine, where Melaine lives, is in the foothills on the opposite side of the city, about an hour away by bus. So after I'd heard her backstory from Kenny, I left the faculty meeting to go and speak with her alone. Of course, following my training in science of mind, specifically the instructions of Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of the religion, I wanted to quickly find out what was worrying her so that I could know what to turn away from. Regulars at this church know what I mean by that. But for newcomers, those listening perhaps online, I'll elaborate. Science of mind or philosophy teaches that the events and people in our lives are there because of the law of attraction. It is a spiritual and mental law that your consciousness attracts your circumstances. That what you mentally focus on becomes manifest. Its corollary is that if you change your thinking, you'll change your life. So I wanted to know what Melaine's precise problem was so that I could get her to focus on the opposites and attract that opposite. To get back to spiritual mind treatments for a bit, most if not all of you should know that that is how they work. Let's say you're doing a treatment for an ill person, whether your own illness or someone else's. What you do in the treatment is declare health is the truth about you or the other person. And for the two or three minutes of the prayer, you concentrate on health. You only briefly mention the illness in the denial step. I hope you all know what I mean by, by that. And if you are doing a treatment in a situation where there seems to be poverty, you focus on the opposite, wealth. Remember, what you focus on manifests. Sounds simple, yes? So why aren't we all healthy and wealthy? For the vast majority of us, it's because we don't focus on health and wealth strongly enough and then go on to act accordingly. The action is, is also important. We allow things that are happening in the world to distract us from the focus. That's what religious science teaches and that's what Jesus meant when he said, according to your faith, it is done unto you. Tell me right now that you believe what we teach and what Jesus teaches. Tell me you believe. Thank you. The first thing that I noticed about Melaine was that she seemed to be squinting behind her glasses. Something seemed to be wrong with her eyesight. She later told me that her glasses needed changing. And the world was something of a blur to her because of the, the glasses. For me, that was symbolic of the thinking, of her thinking, that her life was terrible. Her life was not terrible, as you will hear. But her perception of, of the world was wrong. Now, she said she owed one month's rent, she had frequent blackouts, and that on regaining consciousness, she might find herself in a different place from where she blacked out perhaps a hospital bed. And because of the blackouts, she couldn't hold a job. It wasn't that she couldn't get jobs, she emphasized. But since 2014, when the blackouts began, blackouts that doctors have not been able to explain, she said, 
she couldn't hold the jobs. She told me that because of some home problems, she had to run away from home when she was 14. She told me home problems, but Kenny had previously told me that it was because of incest in the home. When she ran away, she found employment and eventually she put herself through school. And quite proudly, she revealed that she had studied six for six CXCs and three CAPE subjects simultaneously and had got through, clearly a bright woman. Later, she got a certificate in theology and a food handler's permit, she said. She's now 29 years old, has a good command of standard English, and is quite good looking. I asked what work she could do, and she showed me a list of the five jobs that she could think of. Kenny had asked her to make that list, and she could think of five. It took up a quarter of a foolscap size paper. I told her that I wanted her to fill up the page with 15 more jobs. She said she couldn't. To turn her mind away from the I can't attitude, I gave her a little speech about the amazing creativity of the mind and about the great results that students in creativity courses have achieved with practice. There are creative courses all around, and with practice, you really get better. She, she accepted what I said, started adding to the list, and soon reached the 15 that she couldn't have reached a few minutes before, and they filled up the page. Then I had her turn over the sheet, and after further promptings, she came up with another 15 jobs that she could do. They included many jobs that she could do from home. By the time we had given her something to eat, and by that time we had, and she appeared quite cheerful, certainly not the depressed person the security guard had seen walking towards the sea. She had looked so forlorn that he had called out to her, why you look so? Whatever it was that he, she told him caused him to take her inside to speak to Kenny, who is a JP. So after Kenny and I had finished talking to her, he asked her where she would go after she left us. This is hours later. She said that she'd go back home and make a decision about the home-based jobs that we had come up with. Of course, that made me feel so relieved she was not going to continue her walk down to the harbor. Between us, Kenny and I seem to have saved a life. Now, what are the lessons we can learn from Milene's story? One, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. She left home seeking somebody to talk to and she found Kenny and me. I left home wanting a story to use in this talk. And as you see, I got it. I found Mulane. That was number one. Two, your mind is infinitely creative. You can always think of one more useful thing that you can do. This applies in every area of your life. In every minute of your life, there are many choices that you can make. Always another good thing that you can choose to do for yourself, your family, or your world. And why is your mind infinitely creative? Because your mind is part of God's infinitely creative mind, and that mind supports your thoughts and desires. It has to. It has no desires of its own. God doesn't need anything. Right about now, you might be thinking that it's time I got back to my talk on love. Actually, I've been talking about it all the time. Remember how I started this talk with that very common declaration in other churches, not this one, God is good. And the response that I heard from some of you, I was a little surprised, all the time. 
Well, this morning I'm telling you that you need to be very clear what you mean by God is good. You see, religious science teaches that God in its essential form is impersonal. It is a creative energy, not a person. And an energy is neither good nor bad. You wouldn't say that fire is good all the time, would you? You wouldn't say that electricity is good all the time. Fire and electricity kill people every day. That's not something to be desired. So it's not what we call good. So what about when we say God is love? If God is an impersonal creative energy, how could we be saying that that energy loves us in the conventional sense of the word? We couldn't, we shouldn't. What I suggest we mean when we say God is love is that God supports us. People are things that support us. People, we say they love us. I think that's what we mean. And God as creative energy does support us all the time. A common saying in this center is, the universe always says yes to your request. So you see, I've come right back to Millane's story, to the two lessons I said we learned from it. Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. And your mind is infinitely creative because, as I said, it's part of God's infinitely creative mind. It is because of God's love or support for her request that Millane got someone to talk to. It's because of God's support for my request that I got Millane to talk to. It's because of God's infinitely creative mind supporting her that God was able to create a two-page list of jobs that she could do when she thought originally she, there were only five. Here's a problem, though. Science of mind teaches that God is impersonal, but some in our congregation, and I glanced at a couple just now, want God to love them personally. I believe that that desire comes from orthodox Christian churches where they talk about Jesus being a personal savior. And a lot of the hymns refer to Jesus and God as if they were intimate friends. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and so on. Not bad, eh? Well, actually, actually, we do teach that God can love you personally, like a person. When some other human being loves you, it is God loving you personally. So those who want God to love them in a personal way must learn to see the persons who love them as God. And that can be quite a challenge. As this talk draws to a close, let me go back to the beginning, to the Matthew 22 anecdotes. What does Jesus mean when he says, God, love God with all your heart and mind? I suggest that loving a force, an energy, with your heart and mind means emotionally and intellectually heart and mind, accepting that you are part of that force, that your mind is part of God's mind. And loving your neighbor as yourself means supporting your neighbor to the best of your ability, as the universe supports you. I hope I've kept this sh talk short and simple enough. I know I've stood up and spoken up, and I should now shut up <laughs> and sit down. But before I do that second assignment, I promise, be here on Saturday, July 22, at 10 a.m., and help this thriving ministry become more thriving. Why? You'll enjoy it.
Namaste.